Hi everyone, I think we're ready to start. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today. It's Saving Roadside Wildflowers. We're with Liz Sparks and Suzanne Spencer. I wanted to um, introduce you first to Liz Sparks. She is our um, Regional Alliance, uh, Alliance Liaison for the Florida Wildfire Foundation and she works uh, primarily with volunteers that are in the Panhandle in North Florida working to protect roadside wildflowers. She was formerly an FWC planner and paddling trail coordinator with the Office of Greenways and Trails. And then we'll hear from Suzanne Spencer. And Suzanne has been a Florida Master Naturalist Gardener volunteer in Santa Rosa County since 2015. She was our 2019 Volunteer of the Year for her efforts to save the county's roadside wildflowers. And that same year, she was also chosen as the outstanding Florida Master Gardener in, um, in part because of her involvement with that uh, county wildflower program. So uh, we will be taking questions after the, uh, the presentations are over. Um, Liz will present first and then we'll switch over to Suzanne. Um, I wanna mention that they're both in the panhandle, which is um, getting a little bit of action from Hurricane Sally right now. So um, if we do experience um, some technical difficulties, um, please bear that in mind. Um, we, if we don't get to your question, please feel free to email us at info.flawildfires.org. And now um, I, I turn it over to Liz. Hi, everybody, and thank you, Lisa. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today and I uh, look forward to any questions you may have and hopefully helping you get a wildfire program started in your county. So I'm gonna briefly explain the reasons why conserving roadside wildflowers is important. And then I'll kind of delve into how to do it and also some other, other ways that you can become engaged in wildfire conservation. So next slide, please. This is the foundation's mission statement. And I think the second word is very important. We're gonna protect, connect, and expand native wildflower habitat. So a lot of what we're gonna be talking about is creating pollinator corridors or connecting habitat. And this will be an important way that you can plug in. And so I'll give you some ideas how to do that. Next slide, please. The main funding for our license tags are, I mean, the main, the main funding for the foundation are the sale of these specialty license tags. They're, you know, we just got the new one up. Uh, they're very attractive. And this is an impressive amount of um, funding that we've received. So we really appreciate folks that have bought these. And if you haven't, if you uh, think about that next time you get ready to renew your plate, we really appreciate that. Okay, next slide. I want to urge everybody to become familiar with the Wildflower Foundation website. You know, we urge you to become a member and then to get really conversant in this topic. There's all kinds of wonderful resources here. If you kind of go across the green bar across the top, uh, we've got ways that you can find out where flowers are in bloom, give you some ideas for wildflower routes, give you lots of information on how to become a good gardener and how to propagate and how to maintain your wildflowers. There's a few grant sources. Uh, we got all kinds of great information. So really urge you to dig in here and look at our website. And then on the far right corner of that green tab, you'll see all the social media we're connected with, including uh, we have a very active Facebook account and a Flickr that you can also um, contribute to your wildflower photos. And then I'll talk a little bit about the YouTube channel, but there's some great resources there I urge you to connect with. Next slide, please. This is a sample of some of the things that you can find on our website. I mentioned the blooming routes. Uh, one question below that, one question I get asked all the time is where do I find native seeds or where do I find native plants? So this is a good way to uh, go into our website and, and dig in there and find out what's near you. Because we we're gonna talk a lot about the importance of native plants. And then uh, we have some wonderful publications. Of course, we're not meeting in person anymore, but when we do again, um, these are some wonderful um, educational materials that you can fill out a request form and you can get copies or you can print them yourself right off of the internet. Uh, next slide, please. And these are some more resources. We have a seedlings for school program, which are really, if you know a teacher or are friends with a teacher um, or just wanna share this with your own children or grandchildren, there's all kinds of great information and resources about and curriculum that goes along with getting kids connected. So we realize the importance of getting the next generation on board with conservation. And this is a really fun way for kids to get, uh, get connected with wildflowers and the whole ecosystem that goes with it. And then I threw in a slide here for the library. There's all kinds of resources there. So 
everything from um, games for kids and all of our documents and links to field guides. There's all kinds of ways you can get very conversant in this topic. So next slide, please. This is the YouTube channel I recommended and the ones I have the orange arrows to, I strongly recommend you go watch. Uh, the one at the top there on the left, the native plants, that is Stacy, that is one of the staff members and Nancy Bissett. And they've also written a wonderful book. I really encourage you to get that and to watch that, um, learn how to put these native plants in your gardens and what goes where and how to do it. The next one over is Professor, uh, it's uh, Jarrett Daniels, who is a professor at University of Florida at the McGuire Center. He's one of the world's leading uh, lepidopterists and he's on our board and very involved in research and policy making as far as pollinators and our pathway project that we're working on. And the bottom down there is a photo of Doug Tallamy, who is sort of the mastermind of this whole movement. He's written several books, Bringing Nature Home and Nature's Best Hope. He's on TED Talks. And this webinar, I strongly urge you to watch. I've seen it several times now. And every time I watch it, I get more out of it. I just had my mom sit down and watch it with me. And that really has expanded our conversation. So strongly recommend that you watch that. It's kind of, I'm just gonna really get on the tip of the iceberg here. So I wanna just kind of get you wanting to learn more. So strongly urge you to go look at that. Uh, next slide, please. So what is all the buzz about wildflowers? Um, really sounds like really over, overstated, but really wildflowers are part of the circle of life and sort of all about life and death. And let's dig into why I'm saying that. So next slide, please. So what role do wildflowers play in Florida's future? Well, these two slides came from the Thousand Friends of Florida. And they're based on that scary statistic you see from the last census that was taken in 2010, where we have 900 to 1,000 people move into our state every day. It's kind of mind blowing. And there's conjecture that the, the uh, <clears throat> census that's underway now, whenever it's tabulated, we're going to see that possibly be double that. So that's pretty incredible. So boy, is that a lot of pressure on our, our habitats and on our environment. We're expected to double our population by 2060. So what you see on the left there is a map that was created in 2010. So all those large green areas are, are public lands. There's military bases, there's nat three national forests, there's the Everglades National Park, there's state parks, there's wildlife management areas, there's water management district. So it looks impressive. It looks like we have a whole lot of um, conservation land. But look what happens when we get, you know, 50 years from now, we have double the population. All those red dots represent development. Basically, in the middle of the state, the I-4 corridor, it's pretty much solid development from one coastline to the other and all the way down the coast. So this is a little concerning because what you see or what you're witnessing is that the conservation lands that we have are being completely hemmed in and cut off by development. So they're almost becoming museum relics or museum pieces of our wildlife and our pollinators and the whole bit. So what we're gonna do is talk about happy ways we can turn that around. So uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, this is another slide. There's our big orange equipment, just kind of doing all these scary numbers here, how many square miles we're losing of habitat. And the bottom line is all these people in and people moving in leads to habitat fragmentation. So next slide, please. Even when we didn't have the big yellow machines, we're pretty efficient at getting hand tools and going out and cutting roads and cutting through the swamps and draining the Everglades. So we've lost millions of acres already of unique Florida habitat and all those species that were dependent on it. Next slide, please. So this is what habitat fragmentation looks like. Like on the left, this is pretty much the view in a lot of North Florida. You go through just you know, hours of driving going through forested lands. But as the population starts to move in, we start seeing it chopped up. You know, we have to open it up for agriculture. We have to get you know, little league parks, cemeteries, schools, grocery stores. We've got a dollar general every 10 miles. You gotta put that in there somewhere. So we're really chopping up all this landscape. Next slide, please. So what we're proposing is to take the slide on the left where you see these little green dots. These represent like the little islands of public land. So what we're connecting, we're, we're promoting to do is to make corridors between these dots. And there's a number of ways we look at doing this. We wanna connect habitat corridors so we offset that habitat fragmentation. And this can happen in roadside, that's a huge opportunity. Utility easements are huge and in home landscapes. And this is where you come in. So when you look at the map and you see all that green land, it looks like a lot, but it's really not that much. 85% of the land in this country is owned privately. So that puts a lot of responsibility on us as landowners and homeowners to make a difference. So let's talk some more about that. Next slide, please. So we're looking at urban connectivity. We're trying to, we're trying to 
have um, urban folks plug in and make pollinator gardens. We're trying to influence municipalities in their landscaping plans, trying to provide a lot of public outreach and education. And I mentioned the little grants we have for schools and, and the, also the Viva grants for community gardens. Uh, next, please. And we're focusing primarily on connecting the wildflowers along roadsides. This is a huge opportunity and you'll see why in a minute. So we're working with Florida Department of Transportation when there's count, there's state roads involved, and when there's county roads involved, then we have a whole different mechanism and a whole different procedure to follow, which I'm going to tune you into that in a minute. So we're organizing regional wildflower alliances. Um, we're trying to work with lots of different community groups and wildflower advocates and get them to work together. And an important part of what we're doing is conducting roadside surveys. Um, Jeff Norsini is uh, one of our contractors, and he is doing a survey of the big uh, in the Big Bend and also the St. John's Loop. And this is really valuable information that helps drive where we need to focus our efforts and developing corridors. And then we're trying to publicize viewing opportunities, like I mentioned some of them earlier that you can see on our website. But we also created this map you see on the top and on the, on the right that is specifically for the Panhandle for the 16 counties in Florida DOT District 3. And it's a, it's a wonderful map we give away at, visitors, uh, at the visitor centers. And you can also order this online. Okay, next slide, please. So we're looking at road sizes, habitat corridors. And this is a crazy number. We have 4 million miles of paved roads estimated. And they pretty much look like golf courses. So we propose that we can do a whole lot more with that. So let's learn more. Next slide, please. And another corridor opportunity, I mentioned utility corridors. So I was excited. I, I met with National Wild Turkey Federation biologists a couple of years ago and learned about their Energy for Wildlife Rights Endorsement Program. So they're working, look at all these numbers of miles of power line and distribution rights away. That's incredible opportunity. So they're starting to see an angle that's uh, relevant to hunters because they found out if they manage this, these utility corridors different and they stop clear cutting them basically and spraying them, if they, let the, they manage the plants and the mowing so they are like an early succession model, they can meet their goals of keeping the corridors clean for, for their maintenance purposes but they're developing wonderful habitat and that of native plants and that brings in the insects and that brings in the turkey bolts. So this is kind of exciting to make that connection. There's a lot of different ways to look at that and different groups to work with. Next slide, please. So the bottom line is plants and pollinators depend on each other and we depend on both of them. And as they've evolved, evolved together over time, they've developed a lot of specialization so that some some bees and butterflies will only go to certain plants because their proboscis will reach into a certain tubular feature. Or like the little southeastern blueberry bee on the right, this is a really fun thing. It, it, I've seen a slow motion YouTube where it does a sonification dance or a buzz dance, and it will ram into a blossom and get completely, and sort of quiver, just stand there and quiver or do the sonification and get completely covered with pollen. And then we'll fly over to another brand, another blossom and do the same thing. Next slide, please. So this sounds like an overstatement, but it's true. We really cannot survive without pollinators. So if you had coffee this morning, and normally I'm speaking to a room of people and I get everybody to raise their hand, they kind of get that look on their face like, yeah, I better thank a pollinator. The same for chocolate. If you're lucky enough to have chocolate today, you got to thank a pollinator somewhere. So this is really huge. One in three bites of our food. And there's different numbers I see, but that's a lot. It's a lot of um, importance. Okay, next slide, please. So this is a sort of raises flags here and gets us worried. This was a literature search that was done in 2019 for the Biological Conservation Journal. And the map you can see, these are all the academic institutions that contributed to the studies. And kind of the, the abstract is that over 40% of our insect species are threatened with extinction. <laughs> That's pretty scary because that means there's even, there's insects we haven't even really discovered and learned their, you know, learned their function or purpose. Um, habitat loss down there at the bottom is one of the main drivers of the declines that I mentioned. And then, um, Pesticide use, invasive species, and climate change. So those are a lot of pressures, a lot of different ways we're, we're having problems with this. So let's, we're going to get to the happy part and talk about how we can try to turn this around. So bear with me. Okay, next slide, please. So when we're talking about food in the corridors, what exactly does this mean? So this is a slide from Doug Tallamy. And um, next slide, please. Oops, okay. So this is... Um, this is how important the bees are to the agricultural economy. These, all these crops right there wouldn't happen if we didn't have bees. And particularly our th over three, I think we have 350 native species of bees, not the honeybees, but native bees. And they're the huge lifters of the pollinator function. So they're, uh, they're very important to this picture. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this is the one that talks about the, how much food do we need in the corridor. 
This is one Carolina chickadee raising one clutch of hatchlings needs 5,000 insects. And it's incredible to imagine. They are just busy all day long going out and finding you know, caterpillars and bugs. And the, the take home message from this is um, the non-native plants don't provide that food source to the insects. So that you're not gonna find chickadees in a yard that's got Japanese maples versus Florida maples. So when you are given a choice, you're standing in the nursery or the big box store, don't get anything that's got a foreign name on it generally. Try to get something native and think about it. This is a really big choice you make. And if you wanna bring nature into your yard and you wanna bring, you know, protect this whole ecosystem and, and try to help restore it, it's really, really important that all of us kind of look at our surroundings in every sense of the word, right from our right from our front yard, all the way down our drive and all the way out into the community. Um, this is an important thing we need to get on board with. Next slide, please. So again, there's that word connectivity. So on the left, um, don't feel bad if this is your house, you know, you got to start somewhere. Um, this is what my forester friend would call a lunchbox yard, because if a deer walked in there, they better pack a lunch. Uh, there's just not a whole lot going on there for pollinators, but if you look at the picture on the right, these are the owners of the native nurseries in Tallahassee, so they've really been working at this and have an incredibly inviting yard from the point of view of wildlife um, and pollinators and the whole bit. And you don't have to, you don't have to change everything overnight. If you can just start out with a half a dozen plants and just start making changes, everybody can make a little bit of difference. So that's, that's kind of my take home message. Start where you are and kind of go where you can. Uh, next screen, please. And by going native, I've mentioned this several times, you're gonna have a lot better garden success and you're gonna attract pollinators and that's really our focus here. So not only are you gonna have a more successful garden, but you're gonna have a better chance of surviving our extreme weather cycles. Kind of <laughs> Florida's roughly half a year of flooding and half a year of drought. And most of the state is a beach or mostly sandy conditions. So if you're going to the big box store and you're getting plants that were raised in North Georgia or Brazil or Arkansas or somewhere, they don't come from the right temperate zone or climate zone and they don't have the right soil type. So you, you, know, you kind of wonder, why do my plants keep dying? It's like, pay attention to what actually grows in your environment and then replicate that. And if, I'm sure you've heard this over and over, right plant, right place, right time. So it takes some research, it takes some effort to understand what you, is, is gonna work for you and work for pollinators. Next screen, please. So this is, uh, again, finding the native plants for your region. These are some uh, great resources here that you can uh, find on our page. And the Florida Native Plant Society is working on a new website right now that's got a cool function. You can, you can click on your county and also your conditions and you will get a list of plants that would be good for your region. And even if you live in a very, don't really have a yard, you have a patio or you live in an assisted living facility or dorm, don't have any room hardly at all, you can still make a difference with these little pollinator gardens. This is a gentleman that's given um, seminars at the wildflower symposiums every year, and he's really a great proponent of, you know, this is a small change and a big influence. So I urge everybody, even if you don't have space, don't, don't lose out. You can still participate and, and see what kind of wonderful pollinators turn up. Uh, next slide, please. So let's get in, let's dig into the roadsides. So we're looking at roadsides. Um, a huge, a huge opportunity uh, for a number of reasons. The wildflowers like disturbed open sunny sites and that's definitely a roadside. And the periodic mowing, if it's done correctly, can mimic fire and a lot of species are dependent on fire or benefit from it greatly. So there's ways this, this can be done in a good fashion. Uh, next slide, please. And look at this, our state roads alone have more than 12,000 miles of right of way. We don't quite know the total number of county roads, but it's pretty impressive. So some of these roads could be good pollinator corridors and all we gotta do is simply mow half of the right of way less. And it's important to point out when people hear about this program, we are not condoning to quit mowing. We're just gonna mow differently. And we're also not talking about going out specifically planting wildflowers. What we wanna do is conserve the naturally occurring ones. Or if we're lucky to find remnant populations, that's a real bonus. So that's our focus. Next slide, please. So reduced mowing saves money. Um, and I'm gonna let Suzanne talk about this more, but there's been a very happy outcome in Santa Rosa with their successful wildflower program. So she'll talk about that a little bit, but the FDOT is we've done studies to show um, how much savings could be implemented by reduced mowing. And this is a take home bullet. If you want to go to your um, local board of county commissioners and show them a presentation and talk to them about why this is a good idea, there's a number of different angles to get their attention and anytime you can save taxpayer money that usually gets them really interested and that may be the one bullet that they'll sit up and listen to. All right, next screen. 
So reduce mowing, this is a road cut in half. So what we propose to do, if you look on the right, you'll see that circle and it's called the safety strip. So right next to the road, we propose that, and DOT insists that this happens on the state roads, but we think it's a good idea that they keep this mode um, so that if you, it's a recovery zone. So if you lose control of your car, you have time to get back on the pavement and make sure you're not gonna go in a culvert or hit a pole or something. So they, they and we propose they don't start mowing that till May and that gives a chance for the spring wildflower bloom to happen. But if you'll see in that little bubble there on the left, from the ditch down there at the edge of that safety strip on up to where it slopes up to the edge of the right of way, we're proposing that that is the important area. That only gets mowed once a year or perhaps every other year in some cases. But that's important because um, it keeps the trees and woody species from encroaching in there and completely losing your wildflowers. So if you do establish a wildflower area, it still needs to be mowed. It just needs to be mowed a lot less. And we tell them to do it during the dormant season. That's basically when everything turns brown in the winter. So it's roughly December through January, or you could say uh, Thanksgiving to Groundhog's Day, whatever, whatever helps you remember. Okay, next slide. So we have a whole procedure that was worked out in 2014 that um, is a whole process that you can do when you get ready to conserve. Uh, you see some beautiful wildflowers, you get excited about this and you wanna do it. The first way to get started is to get um, a supportive county commissioner to help sponsor your passage of a wildlife resolution in your county. Um, and we have a template resolution you can fill in the blanks and we'll help you with all that. But that's kind of the first step. And if it's if you're wanting to have state roads saved, that proves to DOT that there's local support. And if you're gonna work on county roads or work on both, which is what usually happens, then you've got backup and you've got this in writing. Um, but supporting a wildlife, uh, getting a wildflower resolution to pass doesn't mean you have a program. And a lot of people misunderstand that. And I've, what I'm finding is that some resolutions were passed in the past, you know, 12 years or not 12 years, like eight years and nothing ever happened. Um, and that's because pr there's more to the step than just, just getting a resolution passed. Somebody has to take charge of it. You have to have somebody be a point person or a volunteer leader and work with a team if necessary. There's all kinds of combinations. Um, I have a brand new team starting in Walton County and it's a pair of friends. Um, so you, you don't wanna work alone in a vacuum if you can recruit other people. There's all kinds of different roles. Um, and once we help you through the process, you've got a wildflower resolution passed, you've written letters requesting the modified mowing with some language that we can share with you. We've got all this is in templates, so you don't have to invent it. We can help you just you know plug in the words. Then we need people to go out and monitor the roadside, so make sure that the, the um, flowers aren't being mowed incorrectly, and also to, keep, to get back with the leader and say, um, during the spring and fall when we're generating a report, let them be the point person that goes to public works and says, hey, just want to remind you we have this agreement in place and the blooms are happening, please make sure your mowers are on board with it. And another um, important part, if you have skills that you're a good speaker, you're very knowledgeable about this and you like to write articles or lead tours, there's so many ways that we need to help spread the word and uh, do outreach and education. So lots of ways you can get a team together with diverse skill sets that can, that can make this really work. Next slide, please. So this is from our Wildflower Foundation website. You'll see this model resolution. And if you go there to this page and you click on these counties in green, these are all the places that have a resolution passed. And you'll pull up who the leader person is, if there is somebody there. You'll see what date the resolution passed. And then you can get a little outline of how they went about the program. And I guarantee you every county is completely different. So um, we have 15 out of the 16 counties in District 3 signed on to a resolution. Some of them, the leaders have come and gone. I'm always looking for people to help. Um, and now I'm moving into District 2. That happened right at the beginning of the year, so the pandemic kind of shut us down, but have a very active group in Alachua County. It's super exciting. They have, um, the Public Works Department has already got 405 acres they're managing uh, mostly naturally occurring wildflowers, and they're real excited about this. So we're getting an active group together to help monitor it and sort of be their eyes on the ground. So they're very thankful for that help. So we have all these parts I've mentioned. We got the wildflower resolution. We have a CAN presentation you can take to the commissioners and, and show it to them. Um, we have the request letters if you wanna to write to DOT and say you wanna save a state road or you wanna work with your county roads, we got those letters and educational materials. So we've got plenty of things for you to work with to make this happen. Okay, next page. So this is a step-by-step -step guide. Again, that's on that same, this is the, the uh, URL down there at the bottom. Um, I kind of touched on this briefly, but these are sort of the way to do it. And I'm gonna leave you my number at the end so you can call me and kind of um, 
I'll, I'll help work with you and, and help you give you tips to get a group together and how to best develop this skill set that you've got. So you don't have to, this has been a successful procedure. It's developed by DOT and by Eleanor Dietrich, my predecessor, and they're totally on board with this. They have a very active wildflower program. It varies from district to district, but um, this is a good way to step up. And you know, it's amazing. And my, my final thought for this is whoever you're approaching, uh, remember the three P's that my predecessor Eleanor shared with me, and that's be patient, be persistent, but above all, be pleasant. And I know the times are different. We're not really meeting face to face, but if you get to go meet a commissioner in the future or the public works guys, bake some cookies or take a box of donut holes or something. So it's amazing. They will totally, totally be your friend after that. But remember that we're making requests. We're, we're going to people that do this for a living and ask them to do something differently. So we have to be very diplomatic very sensitive and not go in and you know with a bad attitude and tell them what to do that's just not going to work so um, we have to we have to be mindful of that the next screen please so when you start looking for roadsides this is a little bit tricky because you know if they're being mowed it's kind of hard to say what's there but go out in the early spring go out now and see if you can tell that an area maybe didn't get mowed it's a good opportunity to get it ready for next year and we have this great little document over here on the right you can download from um, our website. It tells you, it kind of lays everything out I've been talking about. And you want to look for the naturally occurring wildflower areas. We're not asking for seeds here. Um, one of the most logical places to look is next to public conservation land. So if there's a park, you know, the chances are good they've been burning it and managing it well. And there could very well be wildflowers spilling out from that area into the roadside. And they could do really well if you're given a chance to grow without mowing. You don't want to find a road that's got a whole lot of driveways because people kind of tend to come out and mow the area right in front of their house. Definitely don't want an area with lots of invasive species and that's something you want to be on the lookout for if they start appearing in the, in the right of way that needs to be county or the state needs to know. And the right of way should be at least five to six foot wide so you've got you actually have a back slope and you have the ability to have a safety strip both. Um, a lot of county roads just aren't that wide. They may only have like a three or four foot wide tiny little right away so it wouldn't necessarily work. Uh, next slide please. So that's it. Uh, the best way to get me is to text that number. Uh, that way tell me you are, have a wildflower question or you listen to the webinar want to get up with me and I'll be happy to get back with you. So with that I'm going to turn it over to Suzanne and it's very exciting to learn how she has um, been a very successful in Santa Rosa County and I hope I uh, wish everybody the best of luck and let me know if I can help you. Thank you. And Suzanne, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can. Take it away. Very good. Hello, everybody, and <clears throat> it's good to be with all of you today. Uh, I want to talk to you about the Santa Rosa County Roadside Wildflower Program. Next. Next slide, please. Just in case you don't know who the Master Gardeners are, we are a dedicated group of volunteers who are trained and certified by the University of Florida who provide research-based horticultural education to Florida residents. Next, please. The topics that I'm gonna cover with you today will include um, a look at our wildflower resolution and kind of highlight some points that, that um, Liz went over with you already. And I want to talk to you a little bit about our program implementation, how we got that going, and then show you some slides of the effects and benefits of reduced and selective mowing. Next. In June 2016, I attended a meeting on behalf of the Santa Rosa County Master Gardeners that was set up by Eleanor Dietrich, who at the time was the liaison for the Florida Wildflower Foundation. This meeting was about how you could establish a reduced mowing program to help promote native wildflowers along roadsides. It was also attended by then director of the Santa Rosa County Public Works, Stephen Furman, and other wildflower enthusiasts from surrounding counties. Those of us from Santa Rosa County decided this program was a really good fit for us. We could beautify our county, increase pollinator pathways, and save money by reducing the mowing along roadsides. It was considered a win-win type of program for us. The Santa Rosa County Board of Commissioners passed the wildflower resolution in July of 2016. Next. 
Here is a main statement of the resolution which encourages citizens to commit to conservation of native roadside wildflowers. It also instructs the county, the county staff to partner with the Florida Department of Transportation and local property owners to plan on how to implement a roadside management program that would increase the visibility of our native wildflowers. Next, please. Once the resolution was passed, we worked with our program partners in choosing which roads to include and how the mowing schedule would be modified on the designated roads. The Master Gardeners and Santa Rosa County Extension partnered with the County Public Works Department at the local level to implement this program. Next. I was designated the contact for the Roadside Wildflower Program and serve as the coordinator with all of our partners. The resolution also made it possible for us to work with the Florida Department of Transportation and to request that they add state roads in our county to their wildflower management program. Next. Last but not least, a most important partner who works with us is the Florida Wildflower Foundation who promotes roadside wildflower conservation throughout the state. They are the reason that we have our roadside wildflower conservation program. All of our partners work together to manage the program that's specifically designed for our county. Next. In determining the roads for inclusion in our program, we looked for those with wide rights of way that had naturally occurring wildflower populations present, just as you heard Liz describe that earlier. The roads with wide areas allow for plenty of room to mow the required 10 to 15 foot safety strip. The safety strip is mowed on a regular schedule throughout the growing season while the vegetation on the back slope up to the tree line is allowed to grow throughout the wildflower seasons. A full right-of-way mowing is then conducted after the fall wildflowers are spent, and that usually occurs sometime after Thanksgiving. Next, please. Once approved as our managed roads, wildflower areas were then marked with these signs indicating where the reduced mowing occurs. These signs are usually placed at the beginning and the end of the managed areas. Next, please. The main objectives for the Santa Rosa County Master Gardener's involvement in the program is to support the Public Works Department and educate the public about the Roadside Wildflower Program. Next. Master Gardeners support the efforts of Public Works by monitoring roadsides for compliance with the mowing guidelines and proper sign placement. Such monitoring includes both the spring and fall wildflower seasons. Missing signs are reported as soon as possible to Public Works so they can be replaced. It's very important that the signs are in place and that everybody on the mowing team understands what those signs mean since they indicate that the areas, that these are the only areas that should have the safety strip mode. Mowing practices have for the most part been found to be in compliance during the time our program has been in operation. We did have an incident in spring of 2019 when an unauthorized mowing occurred on this particular road. And that was kind of heartbreaking because it was done in the early spring when the pitcher plants were just beginning to bloom. So um, we met with the mowing supervisors and worked on making sure that the signs are in place in the future and that the mowing crew is aware of these reduced mowing areas. So this was just a reminder that we all need to stay in contact during the wildflower seasons to make sure that the proper mowing procedures are followed. So it was a learning experience for all of us. Another thing we also do as we're surveying our roadsides is we will monitor for any invasive plant species that are present like Kogan grass 
and report those problems to the, to the public work so they can take care of that. Next, please. We master gardeners survey the wildflower areas to locate, identify, and document wildflower species. This information is used for educational purposes and helps us to evaluate the program. Wildflower surveys have been conducted by the Santa Rosa County Master Gardeners beginning with the initial scouting that took place in the fall of 2016. The surveys and monitoring in the first full year of the program provided a baseline for the comparison of wildflower species present and population changes that were expected due to the reduced mowing frequency. We continue to schedule surveys throughout the wildflower seasons to keep track of the wildflower activity. Next, please. Locating wildflower populations, learning to photograph and identify wildflower species, and becoming familiar with the various wildflower habitats were the main activities during the first year of our program. We scheduled weekly wildflower surveys so that our master gardener volunteers could become involved in learning to identify wildflowers. We've been compiling lists of wildflowers along each of our roads and have recently developed checklists to help us know what flowers to look for during certain times of the year. Next, please. Promotion of and educating the public about the importance of protecting our native plants and wildflowers is a major objective of the program. This slide shows a display, which you see on the left, that was used at several events to let people know, you know what was going on with our roadside wildflower program. And then what you see on the right, the Master Gardener class of 2018 designed an exhibit for the Pensacola Interstate Fair about the wildflower program. We also conduct educational outreach by providing presentations to the public through our Master Gardener Speakers Bureau. I've had the pleasure of also speaking to a Girl Scout troop and leading them on a field trip this past fall. Unfortunately, the pandemic has put this type of activity on hold, but I am looking forward to getting back to doing our educational outreach activities and working with our wildflower team. Next, please. To further our educational efforts about the Roadside Wildflower Program, the Santa Rosa County Master Gardeners presented this pull-up poster banner to the county commissioners in December 2019 for them to display in the lobby outside their meeting room. This lobby gets a good bit of foot traffic since it's also outside the tax collector's office. So we're hoping that people who are paying their property taxes, renewing driver's licenses and purchasing tags are seeing this poster and learning about the program. We also have the same banner on display at our county extension office lobby. We plan to use this banner in outreach activities and upcoming events that feature our wildflower conservation program. Next, please. Let's take a look now at the effects and benefits that occur with reduced and selective mowing practices. You've already heard Liz talk about how the, you know, increasing the numbers and in, in population of wildflowers helps with the pollinators. You're gonna see just in this part of the talk, mostly just about the flowers themselves. Next, please. Reduced mowing increases visibility and growth of wildflower populations. This photo shows several species of wildflowers growing along this one section of road. Under our program, naturally occurring wildflowers are allowed to bloom and to go to seed. Late season mowing actually helps to spread the wildflowers by dispersing this seed. Next, please. The effects of reduced and selective mowing practices 
have become evident with larger populations of several wildflower species like the ones you see here. These flowers cover a span of at least one half mile on this road in the early spring. In the years prior to the reduced mowing practices, these flowers would not have been seen at all because they would have been mowed down in the springtime right when they were putting on their buds. Next, please. This area has a huge population of purple thistles now seen growing in the early spring every year when it is not mowed. Again, these flowers would not have been seen in this abundance had the area been mowed on a continuous basis. Next, please. This photo shows where the safety strip has been mowed adjacent to the road. And on the back slope, these beautiful flowers are flourishing. The photo on the right is a close-up view of the pale grass pinks that you can see scattered along the roadside here. In the past, this whole area would have been mowed along with that safety strip that you see. Next, please. These gorgeous lobelias were found growing in a ditch along one of our managed roads in November 2017. I estimated when, um, when I found them that they covered an area that spanned about 50 feet in length. Next, please. A survey of the same area the following year in October 2018 revealed these lobelias blooming again in profusion along a span of approximately 500 feet. Look closely and you can see these blue flowers scattered in this ditch along with several other species of native Florida wildflowers. And you can also, again, see that safety strip that has been mowed there along the adjacent roadway, leaving that ditch in the back slope for the wildflowers to grow. Next, please. Here's one of my favorite wildflowers. And only a few of these flowers showed themselves in 2017. There were probably more around and we just didn't know it. It's a beautiful native wildflower and it was an exciting find. Next, please. These same Barbara's buttons are now a common sight and found in good numbers on three of our managed roads in the summer months. Again, you can see the mowed safety strip in contrast to the area where the wildflowers are growing. Next, please. Reduced mowing enhances the beauty of our county's roadsides. In late fall, this is now a common view of native sunflowers along Munson Highway. A few years ago, only a few of these flowers were seen on the back side of the ditch along the tree line because full right-of-way mowings were conducted all summer long. Next, please. This slide illustrates so well that wildflowers will be seen in areas that have not been mowed. Makes sense, doesn't it? Again, you can see where the county has maintained the safety strip adjacent to the highway. You can also see where the landowner has mowed the back slope area up to a certain point. Next, please. The unmowed area reveals several species of wildflowers in this close up view of the same unmowed area. To me, this is much more preferable than a mowed and trimmed roadside. Next, please. A very important aspect of reduced and selective mowing practices is this. 
and it's something that's important to all of us. The savings and cost to taxpayers. Studies done indicate that this is a reasonable cost saving estimate, $1,000 per mile per year. Our program was recently recognized by our county administrator as having saved the county taxpayers $210,000 over the past three years. Next, please. Reduced mowing practices help in conservation of endangered and threatened plant species, along with other species of special concern. If you look closely, you can see two pine lilies at the top corners, and these are state threatened species. The white top pitcher plants that you see here uh, spanning the middle of this photo are classified as state endangered species. Next, please. Here's a close-up view of that state-threatened pine lily that was shown in the previous photo. This wildflower has become a lot more visible now due to the renewed mowing practices. And according to Bob Farley, who is one of our Florida Department of Transportation vegetation project managers, this species will continue to spread and and um, grow even in more places with continued avoidance of growing season mowing. Next, please. Santa Rosa County is home to the largest community of pitcher plants in the state. These state endangered white top pitcher plants seen here can be easily seen along four of our five county roads and two of the state roads that are in our program. Next, please. Upon closer inspection, the yellow pitcher plant and the state threatened parrot pitcher plant can also be found growing in the wet ditches on at least two of our county roadsides. Next, please. Our surveys have also revealed four species of native milkweed along our roads. As I am sure you are aware, native milkweeds are important food sources for monarch butterflies. And that's why I consider these plants species that need to be preserved. Next, please. And here are two other of the milkweed species that we've found on our roadsides. Next, please. In closing, I'd like to show, to share with you two more reasons why our roadside wildflower program is effective. These lovely flowers, both threatened species, can now be seen in the spring and early summer months along wet, wet ditches, thanks to our reduced mowing practices. Next, please. I hope this information on our Santa Rosa County Roadside Wildflower Program has inspired you to work in your area to protect and preserve your native wildflowers. Thanks so much for joining us for this presentation. And thank you, um, Suzanne, for your time and effort that you put into the presentation. And I'm always so enthusiastic after seeing um, Santa Rosa's efforts and how they've paid off for um, Native and Natural Florida. Uh, we have some time for questions, and I've seen some come in. So I'm going to turn it over to Stacy to, um, to ask questions. And if um, if you and Liz can remain unmuted, that would be great to answer. Um, if we don't get to your questions, feel free to email us at info at flawildflowers.org and we will try to get them answered for you. All right, Stacy. Okay, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, great. Um, uh, first question uh, is regarding interstates. Do, does FDOT manage the interstate road size or is that another agency that um, handles the management? Uh, the interstates are the Department of Transportation, yeah. It is for FDOT, okay. Mm -hmm. um, another question, um, someone said very often roadsides act as drainage ways and have swales and culverts because they're often wet and swampy. They are often sprayed for mosquito abatement. How have you stopped the spraying for the protection of the valued pollinators? I have not dealt with this, but I know that uh, in the city in individual neighborhoods you can request a no spray zone i think that would apply to a county area as well if you call up public works and um you know specify exactly where you don't want to see the spraying and, and i would mention why um i would make the pollinator connection okay That's something we haven't really dealt with that issue here in santa rosa county but it's certainly something to to consider Great. Um, what percentage of the wildflower strip includes invasive species and do the naturally occurring Florida wildflowers crowd them out as they spread and develop? Well, that's what you want to monitor. You, you want to look for um, an area that doesn't have a lot of invasive species because that's not, you know, if there's a lot of ragweed present or kogan grass, that's doesn't matter for some really good species in there that needs to be dealt with. Uh, and if you have a nice proliferation like some of the slides Suzanne showed where your wildflowers are filling in, that definitely does help um, keep the weeds down. But it, it's, it's a balance. Uh, so it's kind of like monitoring and reporting what you're seeing to, to the people that manage it. Okay. Um, what are issues that might come up when you're trying to promote this to county commission, com commissioners. Suzanne, you wanna, you wanna chime in there? You got some ideas from your experience? Yeah, the main, um, the main thing that seems to come up, uh, now we've just been really happy with the coordination that's happened in our county. Um, but the, the issue that will come up is that people want, are used to seeing their roadsides mowed and they are concerned when they see a bunch of weeds growing. So you have to try to educate people. <laughs> That's part of the educational aspect of, the, of having this program is educating the people about the weeds and the weeds are the wildflowers a lot of the time or most of the time. So that is something that, that you have to address and work with public works on that. And um, I do know that our MO team, they really like the program. It gives them less work, but they also, you know, get, they really like seeing those wildflowers and can start I even identifying them. So that's something that will come up is that's the main thing that I've, that I've heard that's um, against the program. And I'm, I want to add also kind of managing expectations. Like I think when you talk about wildflowers, people immediately think of planting seeds like you see along I-10 and 75 with the Coreopsis and the, and the uh, flocks. So it's, a, it's, again, like Suzanne said, it's like an education process to say, well, you know, it's kind of, a, it's the beauties in the eye of the beholder. And what we're interested in doing is helping the pollinators and the native plants aren't always going to be the real shiny, sh you know, showy ones. Um, so it is the process of letting people see how, you know, the beauty in the natural ones. Um, somebody's asking if they want to address uh, roadways within their city that are managed by their public works department. Um, is it, is there an avenue for this or is it better to approach this on a countywide scope? Well, if I think it's in a city specifically, I would, um, probably talk to a commissioner, talk to a local public official and find out who, you know, how that is managed. And it's different in every county and different in different cities. Um, larger counties have got public works and they may have their own staff that go out and do the mowing or the cities might. Smaller counties may have a county administrator and everything is done through a contract. So it, probably a good place to start is to find um, a sympathetic commissioner and 
you know, arranged to have a meeting and um, kind of talk this over and uh, try to find out where you would approach, you know, who is in charge and how it's managed. I think that's probably a good, uh, and in an urban setting, maybe it may be a lot different. Um, managing roadways, uh, it, it's, it kind of depends on the setting, I think, what you're going to find. Lisa or Stacy, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, this is Lisa. I we actually have um, three municipalities that have adopted wildflower resolutions. So if you go to that map that Liz showed, you can click on them and see the resolution and how it was passed. Uh, there are Titusville, Live Oak, and I can't recall the third one. Um, it's up in the Panhandle though. And I'm just posting that link to the chat. Um, so everyone can have access to that website. That's the our page that you'll find uh, information on wildfire areas and the map that um, Lisa's talking about and that Liz showed in her presentation. Um, let's see. Sorry, we're getting a lot of questions. Um, yes, we are going. We are recording this, uh, so it will be available. Um, as soon as we can, um, as soon as the recording is available, we'll get it posted to YouTube and our website. Um, people are asking about, um, oh here, do, you, do we work with or does your organization work with the Florida Ecological Greenways Network to prioritize wildlife corridors from a wildflower point of view? Lisa, is that something you might want to? Um, are you ta talking about the uh, the wildflower corridor expedition and and um, that sort of thing? We we don't currently work with that group, but um, we have a lot of interest in uh, no, perhaps. Florida, yeah, that's a different. That's this is the Florida Ecological Greenways Network, like Tom Hockter and. Um, are we working with them, Lisa, to prioritize no. the corridors? Yeah. No, not not, not uh, right now, not but mm -hmm. we are pursuing um, a partnership with the Greenways and Trails mm -hmm. um, and looking for a pilot project to, to do along um, a Greenway and Trail um, probably within the next year or so. And how often does mowing occur or should mowing occur during the mowing season? I, well, the, the safety strip mowing, I that's kind of up to the individual county and the aesthetics locally like some counties like it really manicured and kind of that's their expectations you know what we're really concerned about is like leaving the back slope alone that's what we're trying to focus on like as you know kind of as much as the county wants to row the safety strip that's kind of their their prerogative although we really like them to wait until what you know may so we have a chance to have a spring bloom um but the, the back slope is the one we're really, really asking they leave alone until the winter. In some areas, there people request to have a summer mow as well. And if that's the case, the, we, we recommend that they do it in what would mimic the lightning season, basically, like when a, the storms would on their own come through and start fire. That would be roughly July, um, August, somewhere in there. It's like a narrow window. So it's kind of tricky and it also depends what part of Florida, Peninsula of Florida we're talking about. If it's like South Florida, that's going to be different than North Florida. So it's, um, it's something you have to kind of fine tune. And we put actually in our template letters, we, we have that language in there um, about not starting the mowing until May and then the dormant season mowing. And we also say that if a midsummer mow is desired, then you know, that will be a special request and that would happen in that time frame I'm talking about. Okay, and uh, one last question. Any, um, are Florida's welcome centers and rest areas involved in the wildfire program? Are these FDOT or county responsibilities? Uh, if they're on the interstate, then they're FDOT. Uh, and, or if it's on a state road, then it's DOT. I know the 231 um, welcome center um, over there in the panhandle has got a, a really nice wildflower meadow. And I honestly don't, uh, Lisa, do you know about um, other rest areas around the state? I haven't really. Um, I, I do not know. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. That's something it is a good asking. question. Mm -hmm. You usually will see their wildflower signs whenever they're, you know, managing those areas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
And do we have time for one more question, Stacy? Or uh, well, so we have another. We have a couple questions about HOAs, which I know are a little off topic. But I did um, was wondering if you could just briefly say something about our um, panel discussion coming up. Yeah, um, it, that's a great so segue. Um, our next webinar actually is small space, big benefit pollinators in an urban habitat fragment. And we're going to be joining our friends at Stetson University to talk about um, the success they've had in um, restoring a piece of their um, land on campus. Um, our November webinar will be about HOAs and um, native wildflower landscaping. Um, so we will have a panel discussion. We're hoping to have um, a representative from an HOA board as well as a property manager and then um, a homeowner who has successfully worked with their HOA to um, install a, a native um, plant landscape. So we will be sending out the date to that one when we um, when we have the speakers all lined up and I think it's um, it's really a, a very needed conversation that's going to place take place. It's going to be less of a presentation and more of a forum. And with that, um, I think we're going to end the webinar and we want to thank you for joining us. Um, please take the time to take a little survey on your way out and we'll see you next time. Um, you'll please, you know, just watch our social media for um, the, uh, the links to our next uh, registration for the, the next webinar in October. Thanks a lot for joining us.